Hello, everyone. My name is Jim Seberg. I am the policy coordinator for the Medical Cannabis Research Center at Drexel University. We're proud today to have Shalene Title, the former uh, commissioner of the Massachusetts Cannabis Commission, um, here with us. Um, Shalene is also an attorney and drug policy activist who has been writing, passing, and implementing equitable laws for over 20 years. As I mentioned before, she served as the Massachusetts Cannabis Commissioner from 2017 to 2020 and currently serves as the CEO of the Parabola Center. It's a think tank for creating drug policy for people, not corporations. Um, she's put, um, published many papers on social equity and anti-monopoly cannabis policy and testified before um, governmental bodies around the world about uh, reparative marijuana laws. Um, she's done a lot of great things, was named uh, Boston's 40 under 40 list in 2021. Um, from the University of Illinois and now working at Ohio State. We really look forward to hearing what you have to say, Shaleen. Um, definitely have had some great conversations leading up to this. Um, so I'll get the slideshow started here. One second. All right, there we are. It's all yours, Shaleen. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you for hosting me. Thank you to the Medical Cannabis Research Center for putting this together. And um, I always really appreciate the opportunity to talk to students because I got started as a student, um, like Jim said, about 20 years ago. And um, it's still very much this way. Um, but when I got started, it was a great thing to do as a student um, because if you're interested in cannabis um, and say legalization happens in your state, you are starting off at the same time as everyone else. No one else can have more experience than you. And so I find that, um, you know, I'll do a talk in a state that is about to legalize in the next few years. Um, and I will often talk to a student or someone who's really interested and then I'll come back, you know, a couple of years later and that person is totally, you know, dominating the narrative and completely involved in leadership and it's really nice to see. Um, and it's often started by going to presentations like this. It's a really accessible field to be in. Um, so thank you uh, for coming. Uh, I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm the CEO of a think tank called Parabola Center, and uh, we started this because we specifically wanted to talk about um, federal legalization and a lot of the issues that aren't being talked about much, and um, we wanted an organization that was not corporate sponsored or corporate um, influenced. So you can check out our work um, if you want to, that's Parabola Center. And then I also have some papers with the Ohio State Drug Enforcement and Policy Center, um, where I'm currently a fellow. And I really wanted to share all of the lessons that I had learned as a top um, state regulator here in Massachusetts from 2017 to 2020. I primarily focused on social justice and equity efforts and we were the first state to do that. So we had a lot of lessons um, that I want other states to be able to learn from, not have to learn you know, on your own. And um, those papers are free and open to the public. So I will go through my presentation and give you kind of the overview you know, of everything that you need to know if you want just like a general understanding of equity in the cannabis industry. Um, but I'll also highlight for you what some of the best um, recent, most practical accessible papers are so that, um, you know, if you read like four or five papers from last year, you'll be, uh, you'll be a total expert on this topic. Um, so with that, we'll go to the next slide. So I'm going to go through the current status of legal marijuana, the evolution of state regulatory frameworks, which is where almost all of the policy making and regulations is happening at this time, and then where we are with federal law and the way that federal laws are poised to change the industry. And I'm going to do this all through an equity lens, because the first thing I can tell you about equity um, in this industry and really in general is that if you see it as like some kind of separate topic from what you're actually talking about, that's the key to failure. You have to just 
talk about the topic and then weave equity through um, every element of it. So we'll get started with the current state of uh, the current state level legal status on the next slide. So more than a third of Americans now live in a state where cannabis is legal for adults. And I think um, for medical use, it's more than 70%. So the majority of the country uh, can now purchase legal marijuana in some form. And up to 90% of people support um, the legal access to marijuana in some form, including medical. It's a multi-billion dollar industry already. Um, it was 17.5 billion in this country in 2020. And in the next 10 years or so, it's estimated between 25 and 35 billion. It employs hundreds of thousands of people. Um, there's actually a report that comes out every year by the publication Leafly, and it came out today, um, and it was 428,059, uh, 420,000, if you wanna remember, that's how many jobs there are. And the question is really, um, how will we legalize it? Not, uh, will we legalize it? Because it seems very clear um, based on these statistics that federal legalization is going to happen, but it's just a question of, will we make it look like every other industry or will we do something different? Um, I would say from my view, the goals of legalization are um, ending harm, repairing harm and preventing harm. And I'll give you the first, um, paper alert, uh, there's a group called the Drug Policy Alliance Federal uh, Working Group that put together a comprehensive paper with um, federal legalization recommendations, bringing together experts from all different areas. Um, and I think it's a really good big picture. And it took this framing of ending harm, repairing harm, preventing harm, with ending harm being, of course, stopping the arrests and the drug war um, and the unregulated sales of cannabis, and then repairing harm being what's generally thought of as social equity efforts, which I'll be talking about, and then preventing harm, making sure that we're adequately regulating cannabis for health, for safety, and not continuing the disproportionate uh, racial enforcement that we've seen thus far throughout the drug war. And then um, in terms of the current status, just to understand the way that regulations work. Um, so first, if, if you were not familiar with the difference, so a law is what's passed by the legislature. And then typically the law is implemented by a regulatory body. So um, in every state, it looks a little different. Sometimes it's the Department of Health. Sometimes it's the Department of Revenue. More recently, it's a completely new independent agency that just fo focuses on cannabis. So that's what I served on in Massachusetts. And um, that agency will govern the personal use of cannabis. Um, if you use it at home, if you grow it at home, and then the business activity who gets a license to sell it and make the money, and then um, the actual business activity. So the security, the inventory tracking, the testing, um, and everything surrounding the product. So that's what happens in the regulatory process. So on the next slide, we'll talk about the trends in regulatory framework. So the first thing to know is that regulatory policies have a dramatic effect on who succeeds in terms of business. Um, and I want to start with that point because a lot of times I will get um, people asking me, why don't you just pass something that is neutral? Just make it fair, just make it easy, just make it accessible to everybody. And uh, you know, we won't have to talk so much about who's getting the licenses and why. And I completely agree with that in theory, uh, but it's not the way that these laws are rolled out. It is extremely difficult to open a marijuana business. Um, and it would be great if we just had rules that made it look like any other business, you know, and it was as open, as easy as opening, you know, a, a food truck or a convenience store, uh, but it's not. It's extremely layered and complex. And the reason I say the policies have a dramatic effect on who succeeds 
is because if you're hands off and you just say whoever meets the requirements um, gets to operate a marijuana business, it will become dominated by big companies that are coming in from out of state. And we've seen that happen in many, many different states already. Even those like Massachusetts and California that have tried really hard to incorporate equity into their, um, into their markets. So this has led to the rise of a few uh, multi-state operators uh, consolidating and getting bigger and bigger while um, legacy markets, legacy markets is the word for uh, people who were unregulated marijuana dealers in the past. Um, they get locked out of the market as do farmers um, and often small businesses and people of color. So because of that, on the second bullet point, the social and racial equity components of legalization laws are becoming more important. So that was a big deal in New York. I think New York is the key to look at right now um, because New York's law didn't pass the first time or I think even the second time because there was such a push to learn from states like Massachusetts and California and make sure that small businesses were encouraged and that you had goals for the regulators, that you had assistance for the small businesses. And so they're kind of in the beginning of that process right now, but I would say New York is very much um, the gold standard at this point before any stores have opened. It's also key to know that these social equity components are more important because um, it's something to consider as laws are being designed in a state, which is very much a process that you as a everyday person or student can absolutely influence if you want to. Increasing market control and consolidation is something that um, we're seeing often where there's more merger activity now taking place in cannabis than there ever has been before. But it is nothing compared to what we'll see after federal legalization. So um, in other words, there are huge, huge companies, um, Amazon, Uber, the like, that uh, have expressed interest in this industry, but haven't entered it yet, um, probably because it's a federally illegal product. So once federal legalization happens, um, we have to be aware of how much things can change and be intentional about that. And then um, in the last bullet point, I'm quoting an interview I did this week uh, with a podcast called Breaking Points, where um, one of the leading anti-monopoly economists in the country did a segment about the cannabis market. And he was looking at cannabis compared to everything from tobacco to peanut butter, where more than 90% of an industry is controlled by just a few, three or four corporations. And from that view, um, the cannabis industry actually looks pretty promising. Uh, and he called it mostly good news in terms of small businesses and protecting small businesses because if we prioritize and unite now, um, we decide what happens. That, that's what I think. So that's the trend currently. And then let's move on to talking about social equity. So this is what you'll see if you kind of Google social equity in cannabis. Um, these are the things that we're talking about. And I don't like to only focus on these things because like I said before, if you only focus on these policies, you know, and you miss the big picture, they won't be successful. Um, and it can also be kind of dry, but um, these are the three components that you have to understand if you wanna have an equitable cannabis law uh, for, for most jurisdictions. So the first is criminal justice reform. And that refers to people with cannabis records, um, people who have been imprisoned for marijuana, um, in case you don't know, it is very, very well documented that certain communities, specifically um, Black and Latino communities, in some places, Indigenous communities, have been disproportionately harmed by marijuana enforcement. So even though all communities were using and even selling drugs at the same rate, it was those communities who, across regions, uh, were disproportionately arrested and incarcerated. And so the whole idea of equity is to stop that harm and then benefit those communities disproportionately in the same way they were disproportionately harmed. So we talk about automatic expungement. That means um, 
erasing those records and ideally um, erasing all of the collateral consequences that you face if you have a record. So um, housing, student loans, employment, custody, all these different areas of your life can be affected uh, by a drug conviction or a marijuana conviction. And again, we're erasing those because we're making that legal and because it was never enforced fairly in the first place. Um, and then pardons is the same thing, but it would be done by the, the governor or executive. Um, another paper alert, uh, Code for America just did an excellent uh, report on what a good um, law should look like in this area. And the reason Code for America is the, is the um, uh, good organization to write it is because they've helped a lot of states to automatically wipe these convictions from a, a technical perspective. So the second element is tax revenue investment into impacted communities. So the sale of marijuana brings in enormous amounts of revenue. Here in Massachusetts, for example, um, we just reached $2 billion in sales and 20% of that goes to taxes. So um, it's very important that we use this revenue again for the same communities that were impacted and disproportionately harmed. And that is whether or not um, the people in the communities care about the marijuana industry or want a uh, job or employment. And so typically you see the investment taking place through grants or um, different forms of uh, repairing the harm that was done. And Illinois, I think, is at the moment um, the leader in this. So third, this is what I worked on. Um, when you talk about cannabis social equity programs, these are programs where um, when someone is applying for a cannabis job or a license to own a cannabis business, you get special um, benefits if you've been identified as a person who is from a disproportionately harmed community. So there are different ways to identify whether a person qualifies. In Massachusetts, there are three out of six criteria. Um, one of them is being is having black or Latino descent. Um, you also can qualify if you have a drug conviction on your record or you have a parent or spouse who does. And once you qualify, you can take part in these programs um, to either get employment, to learn how to apply for a license, um, you get fee waivers, you go to the front of the line in terms of applications. Um, what we haven't figured out yet in Massachusetts is access to capital, which makes things very difficult for businesses because you can't get a bank loan easily because marijuana is federally illegal. So that's one of the things that other states um, like New York and Illinois have done a really great job. When I said they learned from the first state's mistakes, that's what they were focusing on. Um, and another huge barrier is at the local level. So most cannabis businesses will either have to um, or they will have to get approval from the state level, but then also from the local level. And so that part can be really difficult, especially if you have a city that's only issuing two or three licenses. And so um, that's another thing that states like New York and New Jersey have paid attention to, and any state that wants to be equitable should pay attention to. So I wrote a paper on this. Uh, you can find it. Um, on my website, julientitle.com. It's 10 pages and it very clearly goes through all the different elements of social equity, basically everything that we know so far um, from all the states who have tried it. Um, let me add to before we move on that, even though these are the explicitly social equity related items, I think there are so many other things um, that you would also consider equity. I think protecting medical cannabis patients is definitely one of them. Um, the prevention of oligopolies, definitely one of them. And then fair taxation. You know, I think 20% is politically popular, you know, because 
the legislators who vote for cannabis and sometimes, you know, citizens as well, they want to see that tax revenue. But is it fair, especially for a patient to be pay paying something that high, you know, is it equitable? That is definitely a question that you should be asking. So everything can be looked at through a lens equity, not just of equity, just not just these areas. Okay, so I want to read a quote next on the next slide. This is from 2009. I'll give you a second to read it to yourself. The reason I wanted to include this quote from 2009 um, and even far before that is because sometimes um, when I do these presentations, especially for public health audiences, I point out um, some of the concerns of big tobacco like behavior, which I'm about to do. Um, people will say, oh, duh, you didn't know, like corporate, uh, oh, big corporations always went out. Like, I can't believe you're just you're just coming to this now, or I said legalization would cause that, or blah, blah, blah. So I'd like to put this here because this is not new. Like ever since, at least I started working on legalization, the point was to appropriately regulate it. So you want to take it out of the hands of um, prohibition and unregulated markets, but you also want to keep it out of the hands of big tobacco, big alcohol, big pharma-like companies where they become so concentrated and large that they become difficult to, um, to appropriately regulate. Uh, and then they're able to, like this quote says, aggressively promote consumption, and that really causes its own harm. So you want that balance in the middle. That's the whole point to me of legalization and regulation. And it always has been. So on that note, um, on the next slide, uh, I wrote that this is a universal truth because people feel very differently about cannabis. I think understandably so. Um, some people have gotten so much benefit from it, you know, medical benefit or just general wellness, um, you know, and, and they argue that uh, it should be treated differently because it's, you know, a relatively benign substance. But even if that is true, consolidated corporate power threatens effective public health regulations anyways. So it's really important for us, especially at this particular point where we are on the um, verge of federal legalization, that we're thinking about not repeating those mistakes. And in particular, that we don't fall into the trap of thinking even if cannabis has all of these benefits, you know, and it's been used for thousands of years, there's nothing unique about cannabis that um, prevents these types of manipulative or predatory behaviors from taking place. There's nothing that prevents, for example, cannabis products from being manipulated, manipulated to be more addicted or addictive or profitable. Um, and that's definitely something we have to keep in mind uh, from the equity perspective and from the public health perspective as well. And, and let me give you two quick examples. Uh, there was a New York Times article recently from about a brand called Wana Gummies, W-A-N-A. -A. And um, the maker of these gummies had written in its material, this is a state licensed large company that these gummies would um, help you to lose weight or help you with your diet, something along those lines. And they cited a clinical trial associated with the Mayo Clinic and the National Institute of Health. And the New York Times looked into that, contacted them, and they both said, we've never heard of this study. And it was somewhat shocking to me that you could be, you know, a state licensed regulated company, you know, and be that large and be that misleading. It was the first time that I had seen, you know, a big tobacco like behavior like that. And I found it to be quite a red flag. Um, and then I also wrote a paper uh, called Bigger is Not Better Preventing National Cannabis Monopolies that goes through a lot of the behavior um, that is taking place. And uh, a quick example from this week is that in Virginia and in New Jersey this week. And this will undoubtedly happen in Pennsylvania as well. 
uh, existing medical companies are fighting to get early access to the market um, before anyone else. And in Virginia, I think, you know, regardless of political affiliation, anyone would be annoyed by this because there are three companies who are asking for a two year head start um, and basically a government mandated oligopoly for the first two years so that consumers would only be able to purchase from three companies. Um, and I think that does lead to a lot of these, uh, these public health concerns. We should be aware of it. And it's very much a, a current topic, you know, taking place today. All right, I'll leave it at that. And then I want to close with um, some thoughts about federal legalization. Uh, so this might come as counterintuitive because like I said, I've been doing this for 20 years. I worked on the Colorado campaign to legalize in 2012. I worked on the Massachusetts one in 2016. I've been working on legalization forever. But I feel really strongly that federal legalization should be slow and intentional. Um, one big takeaway that's not in any of the current bills on the table is that Congress does not in those bills authorize the states to continue their benefits for small local businesses. So for example, in Massachusetts um, and New York, we have something called micro businesses. Those are for Massachusetts residents they get uh, certain benefits. If you're a micro business in Massachusetts, you can um, make edibles and deliver them directly to consumers. You can, you can sort of skip retail. But if Congress doesn't make this authorization, those types of programs will end and we will have interstate commerce, which we don't have now. So interstate commerce means a company could um, start a uh, cultivation site in California and then cross state lines and sell it in Massachusetts. That's not how it works currently. If you are selling in Massachusetts, you have to cultivate there. And so that is a huge shocking change. And I'm not sure that people are really understanding what a big difference it, it would make and that any federal bill needs to, whatever the decision is, it needs to be intentional about that. And then the Colorado Attorney General wrote a letter last August um, asking uh, congressional leaders to add restrictions because he was concerned that small businesses would be displaced for exactly these reasons. And I don't think these things get talked about enough. That's why I'm stressing them. Um, if you're looking for information on like equity programs, tax revenue reinvestment, expungements, um, that's pretty easy to find. And you'll find it in um, the MORE Act and the other bills that are being considered by Congress. Um, but this stuff is not as much being talked about. So that's why I wanted to be sure to cover it. And then um, I should have started with the current status. Sorry, the current status is that um, Congress has not voted on a legalization law yet. There is a bill called the Moore Act, which was passed by the House, but has not been taken up by the Senate. And um, there is a discussion draft of a bill led by Senator Schumer, Senator Booker, and Senator Wyden from Oregon, um, which they are taking feedback for now, and they've announced that they are likely to introduce it as a bill in April. Um, it's not considered likely that it will pass in the short term future, but it is very important still that we talk about this and give feedback now because even though it's not necessarily going to pass immediately, it's being written right now. Okay, I'll leave it at that. That's the state of federal legalization. And then I have a closing slide with a couple of takeaways. Um, I just wanted to make sure that you know, if you are interested in this topic, you can absolutely impact the way that legalization is designed in your state. Um, and even at the federal level too, honestly, but a great place to start is in your state. And I think you should, um, if you are interested in this topic, you know, get together with other people, start organizations, um, teach others. This is how I got started um, with the organization Students for Sensible Drug Policy. And uh, without a doubt, we changed laws all over the country, you know, still doing it. 
Um, it's a great career path. Uh, like I said before, you will have as much experience as everyone else. And it's a really great exercise, I think, to read documents, follow regulatory agencies, and then like digest that information and make sure you can communicate it to other people. That helps you become an expert. And then it also helps other people to understand it as well. And it kind of establishes you as a leader and everybody can do that. And then I just wanted to stress that um, sometimes when you're in the moment, you don't realize how much what you're doing is being a part of history, but that's really our, that really is where we are right now because whatever gets put into a place, whether it's in a state or on the federal level, it's gonna be like that for a hundred years unless somebody changes it, right? That's what happened with um, alcohol prohibition ending. There's so many strange little laws and you ask, you know, why is it like this? And they're like, I don't know, a hundred years ago when prohibition ended, that's just how they do it. So this is not an opportunity that comes along very often. You don't get to mm, create markets, you know, and their structure from scratch. If there's anything you don't like about the way other markets look, you know, we could potentially address that here. So keep all that in mind and don't be intimidated. If you're interested, this is a, a wonderful field to go into. So with that, I'm happy to take questions and by all means, feel free to connect with me online. Great, thank you, Shaleen. I do have a few questions here on my end. I kind of wanted to dive in a little bit on, um, specifically with license caps, we've been seeing a lot of conversation around how that impacts uh, a lot of, um, specifically communities of color trying to break into the industry, um, seeing how the, the limit of those caps has really been weaponized to kind of create those oligopolies within states. Um, do you still kind of believe that that's really going to be a part of it moving forward, or should it, that be liberalized as well, um, increasing those caps as well as funding? Um, kind of what's your take on the balance between that? Yeah, I am thrilled to hear you ask that because just like a year ago, I don't think that question would have come up. I think that there was a major conflation before as to what, um, you know, what consumers are asking for versus what companies are asking for. Whereas now, I think people are just starting to understand these license caps in general are terrible. Um, they're the worst thing for equity. And the absolute worst thing that you could do is to just have a license cap with a few available in a state and then not cap how many a person can hold so that one company can just come in and grab all 10 of them, you know, and everyone else is locked out of the market forever. So that's kind of the number one thing I would say, you know, if you have a chance to testify and you have like three minutes, ask for no license caps and ask for restriction on um, how many one person or entity can control. Great. Now I've got two more before we open up to uh, um, outside questions. Um, specifically looking at New Jersey and kind of why it's taken so long since um, they've had their voter referendum and then as well as with the legislature passed. Um, any insight into kind of how they've been operating about why it's taken so long and then also kind of hearing about um, does supply for medical patients kind of play into that decision making as well? Yeah, I feel like I do have some insight into it because I feel like there's a lot of parallels with what we dealt with in Massachusetts with first having a medical program that uh, was very limited and had no equity components whatsoever. And then you have a new adult use agency that's appointed and they're told, hey, completely change this industry and make it equitable and fair. Uh, that's a very tall order. Um, I don't think people understand how long it takes to set up these applications and these structures. Um, and so, you know, the time that has passed for New Jersey is not an unusually long amount of time. I know people say it is, but uh, it's actually like by government standards, an extremely short period of time. And so uh, I think if they want to be fair and if they want to make sure that people have a chance uh, to kind of like all start at the same time, 
um, that takes even longer, you know, and in the grand scheme of things, you know, if something takes a few months longer, you know, and it makes it better for, like I said, a hundred years, like people should think about it that way. Um, as far as the medical markets, uh, I'm not sure if this is what you were alluding to, but there's definitely a concern that there won't be enough of a supply for patients once um, the, med the adult use market opens. I know in Massachusetts, we set aside um, if there was a business that was serving both adult customers and patients, they had to set aside about 30% of their supply so they wouldn't run out. Um, so I think that's a, a good thing to have. But uh, in general, I'll, I'll tell you one more thing. I saw an article that came out from New Jersey today and it said that the eight companies that were um, kind of like driving a media campaign to be allowed to start sales early had not even gotten the local permission and filled out the application that they needed, you know, in order to be compliant with the law. So just give it a little more time, you know, everybody will forget about it in a few years. Gotcha. And the last two, kind of a two part, um, kind of wanted to see both um, any insights and opinions on how Pennsylvania is doing on these issues, um, and then as well, kind of recommendations uh, for the cannabis industry, both on a state and federal level, and kind of how they balance between the two. I'm not an expert on Pennsylvania. Um, I understand it to be a limited license state. Um, and way back years and years ago, I think I worked on some applications uh, for Pennsylvania medical licenses. And I remember like 15% of the application was on your diversity and community plan, um, which I think is good, but definitely not, doesn't fit you know, today's standards for what you need for equity. Um, I did ask around about what, um, organization I should recommend people uh, join and is it is Lehigh Valley the am I pronouncing it correctly yeah the Lehigh Valley normal yes I'm told Lehigh Valley normal is a really good chapter to join so I recommend that um, if people have specific questions um, you know and you want to explain the context since I'm not a Pennsylvania expert I'm, I'm happy to to take that but you know, this seems like I do a lot of work in Ohio. I see a lot of similarities between Ohio and Pennsylvania. So my guess is once the discussion gets going here, it'll be a microcosm for the nation, a really interesting one. Great. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, Professor Warner Simon. Yeah, my question is, uh, what does Shailene think about the uh, Supreme Court asking DOJ, I think yesterday, to opine on whether uh, you can take medical deductions? Uh, you know, it's just like such an interesting question. What say you, Shailene? I think I have anything particularly insightful. I mean, it's just like, so interesting that the question is even being asked. Like that's almost more interesting than the question yeah. itself. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. What do you think? Where do you think that's going? Uh, I think, as we remember, um, the last attorney general, William Barr, didn't have an opinion. So when standing at Kimbo was was uh, uh, opinion, when Justice Thomas's cert denied opinion came out last June, right? It cited to Forbes for Attorney General Barb's opinion, you know, like, like that was wild, right? And there is none yet for this administration. So I think this is a way to kind of inch in, toe in the water, even though to me, legalization is a second term issue. No way, you can't even, no, it, it, it's not happening, not happening unless and until, and it's years away in my view. So it's, this is a, a toe dip. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I think it's really um, important to note that uh, the Biden administration promised in its campaign promises, right, that it would not legalize but decriminalize marijuana and that um, it would issue pardons. So I think those are, are fairly likely to happen if there's enough pressure, given that it was a campaign promise. Um, but yeah, perhaps not till a second. Term. Well, I have to tell you, there are many campaign promises, but since all the Democrats are not in line and we can't even build bridges, right? Uh, you know, or get voting, I just don't see pardons happening now. 
I think it will happen later, but I don't think don't see it happening now. We don't have the capital to make, you know, it, there isn't the, the, the will. We don't, there was no blue tsunami, blue tsunami in, uh, in 2020 to make that happen, in my view. Opinion, this is opinion, not fact, opinion. <laughs> Great. All right, uh, Larissa. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask about the argument for um, kind of home growing, especially for medical patients. I know in Pennsylvania that was like. We went on mute. I'm sorry about that. Um, I wanted to get your opinion and some insight on the argument for home growing for especially like in Pennsylvania for medical patients um, and then how you would help push forward policy and regulation to put any kind of enforceable regulation I guess on that if it is approved. Yeah um, so I think no question um, if you are a compassionate person who has any compassion for medical cannabis patients, you will be in favor of limited home cultivation because um, you just can't necessarily get to, um, especially in a limited license state, uh, a store that has the product that you need. And there are so many different types of products and you know stores can't necessarily carry them. Um, but I think also it was my first, one of my first recommendations in my anti-monopoly paper because it provides a check um, when you have the option of home grow. You know, of course it's allowed for um, alcohol and, and similar products. Most people don't make their own alcohol, but you can um, for a hobby or for whatever reason. I'll say too, in Massachusetts, um, we allow six plants per person and way more than that um, if you're a patient and you need it. And none of the problems that um, people suggested uh, would happen when they opposed it have happened. I've, I've yet to see really. The only time I ever saw concerns was way back when Colorado allowed home cultivation and, but didn't set any type of limitation on it. So there was this urban myth that you could grow up to 99 plants um, without attracting federal attention. So you had all of these people growing 99 plants that caused some concerns. Um, but other than that, if you have reasonable limitations, uh, it's a no-brainer for me. Thank you. Um, and if I can, just, I guess, the follow-up, how can you go about making sure if you're creating policy that you're not kind of accidentally setting people up to be targeted? Like, I think if we, like, allowed for home cultivation, how do you make sure that different minority groups can't be, like, disproportionately targeted and, like, that be the excuse for why, um, I don't know, they're being looked into or they're uh, being harassed, if you will. Like, how do you set a limit for what's allowed, but then also not, I guess, uh, yeah. I understand what you're asking for sure, Thank yeah. <laughs> when I said ending harm, repairing harm, preventing harm, that's a big piece of the preventing harm because we have definitely seen that after legalization, arrests go way, way, way down as you would expect. But from what's left um, for, yeah, say a violation of home cultivation rules or whatever, um, they remain disproportionately enforced against people of color, black and brown people. And sometimes that disproportionality even gets worse after legalization. So um, that is something to pay a lot of attention to. Um, I can give you a lot of examples. I'll just give you one. Um, what we saw in Colorado, the first state to legalize was that there was a crackdown on juveniles, people under 21 who weren't allowed to possess marijuana, but were. And so in Massachusetts, we made sure that if you're between 18 and 21, um, it was essentially decriminalized and a civil fine. And I think maybe your parent gets notified under 18. But uh, the point was we were watching what was happening in other states and then proactively addressing it. And you have to do that in everything enforcement related. You're absolutely right. Thank you. All right, Kara. Hi, thank you for such a great presentation. I'm new to this type of policy work. I'm um, getting, I'm starting my uh, first year as an MPH candidate. And I just recently wrote a paper about um, like transportation laws in regards to PA. Um, Cause I thought it was really interesting that um, there's, 
uh, no tolerance THC policy. So if any driver is found to have THC or any of its metabolites in their blood, then um, they would be given a DUI. Uh, and I thought that was really interesting because there were no protections for medicinal patients. So I was wondering um, how other states, especially ones that have legalized marijuana recreationally, I know some have employed say law, per se laws, but um, they, it's kind of arbitrary numbers because THC volume in your blood doesn't really tell you anything about impairment. So um, I was wondering uh, what your thoughts on like uh, like impairment tests, just like field tests that transportation uh, law enforcement officers could use, things like that. I could definitely talk about that all day long, <laughs> but let me give you like a, a quick answer. So you're absolutely right. So per se laws is when you try to um, make it equivalent to uh, alcohol and you're looking for a certain amount of THC in your blood. Um, that's terrible. That does not reflect impairment at all. And there is no technology as of this time that uh, properly measures impairment. Um, there's something called the Drug Recognition Expert Program, the DRE program. If you're a law enforcement officer, you can get this special certification. Um, and in Massachusetts, we actually had a really interesting um, I'll tell this quickly and then in, in 30 seconds, it's so interesting. So there's a new technology that they were testing, uh, Mass General Hospital, where you actually look at a brain's image um, rather than signs of impairment from the outside. Uh, and they were finding that it's quite promising. They compared it with DRE kind of as a control because DRE is considered the best standard right now. And they found that those law enforcement officers named 20% of sober drivers as impaired. Now imagine if those people had gone to jail for impaired driving, they were actually sober. Uh, just shows that they kind of accidentally debunked DRE during the study. Um, the brain imaging might work, we don't know, um, but as of now, impaired driving is illegal um, and there are body cameras and other ways to gather evidence uh, but I think the bottom line is impairment uh, is uh, per se laws is definitely not the way to go. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Sure. Um, I, I'm, uh, really quickly could ask, um, I've just been seeing a bunch of THC Delta 8 products in like convenience stores and I don't understand how that's legal and THC Delta 9 is not just because I hear they're biologically very similar and how they affect people. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. I think it's a sign of the chaos that could happen after legalization, frankly, that you can buy it, you know, in a gas station and it's pretty much completely unregulated because it falls in a technical loophole. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lankenau. Thanks, Jim, and thanks, Shailene. Um, I'm Steve Lankin. I'm directing the, the Cannabis Center here at Drexel. Thanks so much for this excellent presentation and discussion. And um, my question kind of returns to the social equity issue. And as you were talking, it occurred to me that besides just being really good policy, that the social equity is almost key for regulation to work because I've observed in California, for instance, there's a lot of the, you know, the legacy market in some cases is starting to really <clears throat> overwhelm some of the legal market. There's been a lot of pressure around black market. And it seems like if, if there's not like adequate space for equity and diversity in the, in the kind of legal market, that the legacy market will continue and will put pressure on the legal market, a new adult market. So I'm wondering just how, if you've observed, California may be an unusual case because it has such a, a robust uh, legacy market, but I'm wondering how you've seen that work, say in, 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 in Massachusetts or Ohio, like if that, the legacy market, so there's probably a lot of um, individuals who are um, African-American, Latino, who are still operating in that market, they can't get into the adult use market. And, that, and so they're sort of working on the fringes in this legacy market and just how you've seen that dynamic play out. I think you're completely right. Um, I think, yeah, on the West Coast, it 
tends to be more pronounced because you had this big gray um, market before legalization. But either way, when I get asked, oh, the illicit market is such a big problem, what's the quickest way to transition people to the regulated market? It's exactly what you just said. It's a pathway so that people who are currently selling illegally can now sell legally. And I would say no state has done that successfully yet because the barriers are just too high. But once they do that, people will transition, the customers will transition, the customers will have the convenience and the price and the access that they want, which research shows is really the number one reason why people, why customers transition because there's look, they're looking for those factors. And we can do all of that without a criminal crackdown, right? So I think you're totally right. Thanks. Great, Justin? Yes, hello. Um, yeah, thank you for this talk. And I have a bit of a question. It might be a little bit out of scope, but um, you know, if it is, just feel free to express that. But I have a feeling or a hunch that legalization of cannabis and probably other substances as well might inadvertently reduce harm kind of across the board when it comes to people that might use it for medical reasons or honestly any reason but um, kind of have maybe issues with anxiety or feelings that they'll be, you know, thrown into, into jail or, or caught by their families or something. Um, and I haven't really searched that far, but I'm, I also haven't seen any literature or science to kind of back that up that, you know, legalization would prevent issues in general when it comes to harm reduction. Um, just because of people having bad experiences on on these substances. Do you have any knowledge of maybe any science or any support that, that um, or you know, maybe not support um, of that idea? Um, I, I think I, I agree with you big picture, but I, I didn't catch it. Could you just say you're looking for a science that um, that supports what? Um, I guess the potential link between legalization and like psychological, um, I guess harm reduction in a psychological sense for individual users, you know? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it's I think it's really intuitive that uh, when you are able to access a regulated product that's been tested that you can get without you know risk of of arrest or law enforcement interaction, um, that it would certainly be a form of harm reduction. Uh, but I'm not sure if I've seen that in a study. Um, maybe I can follow up with you afterwards if I think of one. It's a great question, but I do okay. think that's accepted as intuitive. Yeah, thank you. Because there's, I mean, there's just so many ways to appeal to people in, you know, helping them understand what legalization could could offer or afford people. And I feel like this might be something that some people either relate to or or can start to see. Okay, yeah, that that kind of makes sense. So, yeah, thank you. Sure. And um, just real quick, I think the nice thing about that is that it's not unique to cannabis. I think it would very likely apply to other substances as well. Right. Yeah, that's and it's cool about it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Great. So we do have uh, one more question. On, I'll tack on another after that. This is from Carson in the chat. Um, as they recently legalized recreational cannabis in New York and other states, do you have any insight or thoughts on how any legal change or the lack of legal change is affecting those who have previously uh, been incarcerated or are currently incarcerated for marijuana use? Um, how is it affecting them? Well, I'll say this, I was recently on a call um, with Senator Schumer and a number of different activists from New York um, and across the country. And the group that was, I'm sorry, I can't remember who they were, but they were working on um, expungement and release and resentencing for people who had been incarcerated. And I know that they were running into trouble with deportation issues and they were kind of talking to Senator Schumer about the mechanics of it. Um, I got the sense that, and this is what I've seen in Massachusetts as well, uh, it's a very popular, um, 
and frustrating idea for people that we have people who are, in, what's popular is that we should let them out. What's frustrating is that we have people who are in prison, but then when it comes to actually legally letting them out, that gets really difficult, especially if you know it's in the law that it happens on a case by case basis, because then it just doesn't happen. But putting it in, you know, blanket into a law is really difficult as well. So definitely New York is one that is struggling. I think everybody's kind of struggling a little, but with each state, you learn more about how to do it um, in a better way. If this is an interest of yours, again, I really want to um, recommend the Code for America report on this topic, which goes into it in depth. Um, and like we mentioned a minute ago, definitely pressure the Biden administration to pardon these folks. I mean, the one piece of good news is that I don't think that there are a large number of people still incarcerated for possession and use. Um, perhaps if you factor in, you know, breaking probation and, um, you know, other things like that, then it's a larger number. And, and certainly it should be zero, um, but it's not like masses and masses of people at this point. So the last question that I have is kind of breaking it down between the argument for legalization and decriminalization. Um, we hear a lot of politicians now who are really kind of afraid to take that jump to say they want full on um, legalization by saying decriminalization because of that point of no one should be incarcerated for something that is seen as less harmful than alcohol. Um, from a public health perspective and kind of what I've learned here at Drexel um, is that we always try to meet people where they're at with policy and try to try to make sure that there are ways for us and mechanisms for us to have public health interventions to um, kind of reduce harm and um, kind of help people make the right choices on, on a more policy or societal level. Um, in, in your experience, um, kind of looking at decriminalization versus legalization, where do you see the real importance of it being? Is it kind of in the fact of how unequal decriminalization has been applied, such as the difference between possession and cultivation or kind of the arbitrariness of, of the police's interpretation of what is selling versus possession? Um, can you speak to anything on that? Yeah, so here in Mass, we decriminalized by citizen initiative in 2008, and then passed medical in 2012, and then legalized in 2016. So we kind of like saw the whole thing in a systemic fashion. Um, you know, as you've seen some things, I've, I say no brainer question, but some things that's just more complicated. I think that it's a really complicated question because the benefit of decriminalization is it's easier to do politically. It really ends a lot of harm quickly and simply. And you don't have to deal with so many of the complicated questions. And potentially with legalization, if we do it the complete wrong way, we're perhaps even causing more harm than prohibition. You know, So for all of those reasons, I feel like decriminalization is a really safe bet. Um, but then on the other hand, it's, it's such a half measure because you're not creating a legal marketplace. You're not allowing for testing. You're not protecting consumers. If you look at the Netherlands, you know, for the past however many years when they had cafes in Amsterdam, um, but no legal form of a market, it's a really weird system that doesn't make any sense. So um, I think, you know, you could go either way. Probably the very safest thing you could do is decriminalize and then give yourself like three to four years to come up with a regulatory structure to legalize and make sure it's smart, it's evidence-based, you know, and, and you're not in any kind of rush. I think that's the ideal situation. Great. All right. Do we have any other questions um, from anyone? Let's give you a second there. So I think we're all set. Shaleen, thank you so much. Oh, wait, Joe, you got something? Yeah, um, Great. just a quick question. One of the things that I'm seeing is um, how do you prevent, which of course anybody's allowed to sell, you know, sell their business if they want to sell it to a larger corporation. Well, how do you set up something to encourage the smaller dispensaries who are just kind of jumping in on their own for the first time, you know, to re resist that temptation from being bought out by some of the larger companies that you're seeing across multiple states. So for example, in Nevada, what I see is, 
you know, they, you know, a dispenser will open up, you'll see a brand name. And then several months later, a year later, all of a sudden that name is taken down and you see one of the names that you see across multiple states. So what kind of, you know, structure can you set up to try to encourage those smaller businesses to, you know, stay in business, whether it's support with, you know, something as simple as, you know, human resources or legal support or just regular business operations that maybe they're struggling with where a bigger corporation has that manpower and that know-how? That's such a good question. I guess we're closing with the hardest question um, because we every regulator really wrestles with that. I saw Diana Howe now, the chair of the New Jersey Commission, just say today in an article that um, even if she feels something is predatory, it's not. It's ultimately not up to her because you can't, in law, tell people who they can or can't contract with. Um, you can only put on appropriate guardrails and everybody's idea is different. I can tell you what we did in Massachusetts, which I think is, I, I'm pretty proud of, but there's a lot of different ways you can do it. So what we did is if you are a social equity business, you get so many different types of help. And um, for example, you mentioned, you know, legal human resource accounting assistance. We teamed up with local law school clinics and graduate business schools who provided that assistance to them. And we personally trained um, those trainers, which nobody else got that kind of personal attention from the agency. And then we set a limit where you can only own up to three of a particular license in the state. So if you have your own and you buy two others, you are done. And then for delivery, um, we wanted that to be the low barrier accessible license. So that's only for social equity licensees for the first three years. I would have preferred five, but three is where we ended up. And the thinking there is that's enough time where you get a runway um, and nobody else can get that license. But then after that, it's up to you um, if you want to sell or if you want to keep going, you know, and that way we're not being too paternalistic, I hope, but we're making sure that those benefits are, are real. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Shaleen, so much for your time. Uh, this is a great session. Um, for everyone else, we'll be posting this to our uh, website on the Medical Cannabis Research Center. If you have any questions at all, um, about Shailene's two papers. You can find it on her website or feel free to reach out to me and I can send you the links along. Um, I'll certainly make some introductions as well um, offline. Um, everyone have a great evening. Thank you very much, Shailene. Thanks so much for hosting me. Appreciate it. Good touch.